So the question I'm going to answer is uh, what is a playable character? And more than that, I'm going to tell you a bit about how to write or design a playable character for a LARP. Uh, now, before I do that, I just, I'm just i not going to talk much about this. You can find it on my blog, but it's, it's an attempt to map out all the elements you can work with in LARP design. Uh, and the part we'll focus on now is kind of like these things. So we're like looking into one, one aspect of LARP design. But another thing about LARP design is you very rarely work with everything. You often focus on a single thing, and the most common thing to focus on in LARP design is the character. So this is a good place to start. There are two basic ways we can approach designing a LARP. Now, one is a top-down thing. I think uh, Johanna talking about Halatisar had a good example of this. They began with the world. We want a world wherein uh, we can show Finns what the occupation looks like. And then they focus on the society, move down from there. Okay, in this world, the University of Helsinki might be an interesting place to explore. Uh, which groups we have there. Okay, we have some students, and then we have some uh, members of the military, and then we have a Jordanian minister wi visiting, uh, and down from there to the individual characters. That's kind of a top-down approach. Uh, the other one, which I think uh, we should imagine for this lecture, is the bottom-up approach. We begin with the character, who is an interesting person to write a lot about. Uh, to who uh, does this person have relationships? Wh which people are around her or him? Uh, in what kind of society do they have? What kind of world do they begin with? The opposite approach. And of course, it's very hard to separate these entirely because you always begin thinking about the world when you're thinking about the character and vice versa. Now, can I ask you to just think for a moment? Uh, if you imagine your own uh, parents, what would you need to write down to communicate to somebody else. You don't know who, somebody on a different continent, a different time, five years from now, will need to play your parents. Which things would you need to write down so that they could persuasively play your parents? And then think about yourself. If you were going to communicate yourself as a character for somebody else to play, what would you need to write down so that they could persuasively play that person? Does this seem difficult? Yeah. yeah. That's my point too. Creating a full, real, whole human being that somebody else can just instantly begin role-playing is difficult. And thankfully, we usually don't need to do that. Usually, we need to provide some instructions that help them behave uh, the way we need them to behave in the LARP, uh, and then leave the, leave the rest up to them. Uh, so I'm going to play the character of a father in, in the LARP, which is about uh, a, very, um, a very harsh and controlling father. And this is based on somebody else's uh, life. Uh, I don't know, no, need to know everything about the, um, the person I'm trying to imitate. I just need to know this thing that I'm supposed to be harsh and controlling and have some suggestions about that. And then I can perform my role in the LARP. So it's these minimum instructions that we're looking for. Character design, I have to remind myself and you, is art. It's not engineering. There is no ult ultimate right and correct way to do work with characters, and there is no ultimately wrong way to work with characters, although I'll bring up some things that I still think are wrong. Nothing is true. Everything is kind of permissible when you design characters. But what is a playable character? Or the first question, though, what is a character at all? It's the person you pretend to be when you're role playing. Uh, but we also use the word in a slightly different sense. It's the person the designers tell you, uh, or what they tell you about who or what you should pretend to be when role-playing. When I get a piece of paper that says, you are the harsh controlling father and your name is Bob, um, and you like donuts, uh, then I also call that piece of paper my character. So we use it in both senses. It usually works. Eric, you're standing a little in the text. <laughs> like this? Yeah. Uh, so, there is an example of a character being played. The guy to the right here, uh, he is called the Belgian chimpanzee. Uh, he has um, uh, his character, his written character tells him that nobody really knows who he is, but he is known as the Belgian chimpanzee. He's very tough, he, uh, he wins any drinking competition or fight he enters into, uh, and he hangs around with the resistance fighters and mafia people at this musical LARP that we run. 
So here's uh, the Belgian chimpanzee to the right here, and this was the Belgian chimpanzee at the first time we played this game. And he went around and he was a very tough guy. He spoke with a Belgian Walloon accent, the player was French, so he used his French accent in the game. Uh, and he kept winning staring competitions against other people and so on. People were afraid of the Belgian chimpanzee, but also intrigued by him. The second time we, were, we ran the game, this is the Belgian chimpanzee. Uh, he wore a top hat, he wore dark glasses indoors. Uh, he was barefoot and he wore a long coat and he walked around being kind of mysterious but everybody knew he was a Belgian chimpanzee but he retained that mystery about who is the Belgian chimpanzee. And this is the fifth time we ran the game. This Belgian chimpanzee, she is sitting there on the chair. Uh, she was very much a chimpanzee, see, she moved around and uh, scratched underneath and jumped up on chairs and even almost said ooh, 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 in this chimpanzee-ish way. Now, the question, of course, which of these characters is the correct one? And the answer is all three. Three different players brought three different aspects out of this character to make it interesting for the others. Uh, our goal as, a desi as designers in, in including this character to add some color and mystery to the game worked out perfectly with all the, all the three different interpretations. Must our character be playable? The answer is actually no. Not all characters need to be playable. Why not? Well, you have some LARPs where players are basically herded through the LARPs, say by the adult leaders. Uh, the Red Cross in, in Scandinavia runs a game called uh, Poflukt on the Run, uh, which is about simulating a refugee experience. And pretty much all of it is facilitated by uh, adult organizers who chase the kids around and take them through signposts and, and border posts and bureaucracy and so on. And in this case, the individual characters don't matter that much to the game experience because everything is being framed by outside forces. But if you depend on your LARP having some kind of player initiative, that players come up with additional content, that they improvise, they add, they deepen the stuff that you as an organizer or designer have given them, uh, then yes, you need to focus on playability. So what makes play playability? In general, these slides will be found online. Um, they're actually already online uh, on the LARP Writer Summer School website. So you don't need to write down anything. Uh, except uh, the slides I will come to in a moment. But before we come to the, what, the three criteria of the playable character, let's take a look at char characters that are not playable. My favorite example is this guy. <laughs> uh, how, how, how many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings movies? Or read the books? I see most of you. This is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, a uh, uh, hero and a king and so on. Uh, and actually, this is not really the, um, the um, unplayable character. This guy is. When he first makes an appearance in the books, he's this mysterious stranger who hangs around in the corner of an inn. Oh, the inn. Whoop. <laughs> Turning golden birds overhead now, but uh, smoking a pipe and doing absolutely nothing except staring around and being mysterious until four hobbits, little, uh, uh, little people, come in um, with a magical ring. Uh, and uh, some, some nasty things hunting for them, and then he suddenly can drop his cover and stop being Mysterious Stranger. Now, in the 90s, when I started LARPing, this was a very, very popular request. Can I be a Mysterious Stranger in the corner of the inn, waiting for uh, uh, people to come in? Uh, and, and watching everything and so on. And it's a very safe character to play, because you, you only need to hang out in the corner of the inn and act Mysterious. The problem is that unless you're in, you encounter four hobbits with a magic ring, you have nothing to do and no reason to interact with anyone and plenty of reasons to not interact with anyone. So unplayable characters, to use uh, Strider as an example, they are invisible to the other characters. They're someone who you don't have any reason to notice in the game. Your character doesn't have any re reason to relate to their character. Uh, they make the player unsure or insecure of how to play them. Um, they don't have a hook into the current group or LARP, like no four hobbits, no reason to interact with anyone. But if you put someone in, a, in an inn in a fantasy world, medieval style, uh, somebody who loves telling stories has a really good reason to, to hook up with other people and, hey, can I tell you a story? Or somebody who collects stories, or somebody who likes to drink mead. Uh, unplayable characters don't have anything to do with the LARP. Uh, maybe you are um, the Emperor of France, uh, but you are at the, at the LARP about um, uh, a farmer's wedding and you are uh, hidden, You're, you pretend to be a tramp, 
and you have no function in the game at all. There's, there's nothing playable in that. That might be based on untrue and unrealistic assumptions of your playstyle. Like some people have a playstyle that is very extrovert, very theatrical. Uh, some people have a very introvert playstyle uh, where they do a lot of mentalization. Uh, some people really enjoy adrenaline and action. Uh, some people enjoy more, more of the slow play. And if you miss in assigning the right character to the right person, uh, it becomes unplayable. If I expect someone to be always grabbing attention and taking the center of the stage, and that player is actively very uncomfortable doing that kind of thing, or enjoys more the quiet play between two people, then I have an unplayable character. Uh, and they might also be based on untrue or unrealistic assumptions of your co-player's play style. Like if I cast someone as playing the uh, very extrovert attention-grabbing character, uh, and, this, uh, and, and I surround this player with a number of other characters and players who are extrovert and attention grabbing as well, they will not be the center of attention. So the, the play style really factors into this. Playable characters are ba basically the opposite of the unplayable things. They're visible to the other characters, um, they're clear about how you play them, uh, they have a hook into the current group or the LARP, they have things to do, uh, they fit the playing style of the people who are cast to them, and they fit the play with the play style of the co-players. So this is the stuff you can write down. This is the summary, the only slide you need to remember. Uh, a playable character has three aspects. It's clear. Clear in the sense that when I receive the information about the character from the organizers, I understand what they want me to do at the LARP. I understand which, uh, which frame I have uh, to play within, what is appropriate and inappropriate for me to do with this character. They have activity. They provide me th with things to do at the LARP. I have a function in the LARP world. I have uh, reasons to do stuff. Uh, I have advice on, do to, on doing the stuff, perhaps. And they are connected. They have a place in the group society. I start out with other characters that I somehow have a reason to interact with, and I start out with an understanding of what the interaction between these characters will be. So if I'm playing in a family and I'm the oldest son, and I know that I'm close to my mother and I'm distanced from my father, and I have a sister who I love dearly, uh, and I'm kind of protective of and so on, then suddenly one, I have a reason to interact with all of these players and different ways of doing so. I can quarrel with my father, uh, I can support my mother, I can pay careful attention to my sister. And that's the connectivity aspect. Uh, there are three steps in uh, creating a character as a LARP designer. Uh, figuring out the, the good playable characters, that's a creative process, the artistic process of coming up with character ideas, coming up with people that would be interesting to play uh, and that fit into your LARP. Communicating them, making sure that the player who receives the character uh, know what they need to know about it, that's the clarity aspect of it all, and the interpretation. Uh, when somebody gets a piece of paper or some verbal instructions or a picture or something uh, and are told to uh, play this character, uh, what they do then is they take these few hooks they can find and they add their own experience, their own interpretation, their own ideas on top of that into a full character interpretation. And this can be facilitated by the designer through drama workshops and dialogue and other methods. Now, the interpretation part is not covered by this lecture, so you know. I'll be talking a bit more about creation and communication. There are also different ways you can work with designing characters. And I'm using written characters as an example a lot here, but written characters are by no means the only way you can provide your players with characters. Uh, they can be player made, and this is common in some LARP traditions, that if somebody says, I'm going to have a LARP about a spaceship, and then you immediately write them, I want to play uh, the captain of the spaceship, and then they write back, cool, yes, you're the captain, or they write back, no, no, we already have a captain, or this spaceship doesn't have a captain. Okay, I want to play an engineer, and uh, uh, a very angry engineer who keeps making trouble for everybody else, and then I reply, yeah, okay, go ahead, now you have a character, and then the LARP is built in this way. You know? Or uh, you can be a group of people, you can be a sign, okay, you are the engineers on the spaceship, uh, and then you figure it out, and then we, there are five of us, we're going to play engineers, and we figure out, okay, this is the grumpy engineer, this is the happy engineer, this is the chef who always makes food with the other engineers, and uh, is the social glue in the group, and so on. So, as players, we can figure out a lot of this ourselves. There's also the organizer-assisted organizer mode, where the organizer or designers come in, hold workshops, uh, uh, more actively filter player suggestions, and so on. 
uh, or enter into dialogue, like instead of, oh, you can't play the captain, go and ask, so what is it that you want to experience that makes you ask me for the character of the captain? Oh, well, I, you know, I want to experience being in the middle of action and so on. And, oh, yeah, but well, maybe we can make up a character who is like this or that. And then finally, you have the organizer made characters. You can write them. Uh, or you can make mixed media characters. You can use pictures, sounds, and so on to define a character. Only this is covered in my lecture now, the written characters. Just be aware that there are a lot of different ways to approach this. So, how do you communicate clearly a character that people should play? I'll give you seven examples, all based on different ways of describing the same character. Uh, and I see a lot of sleepy faces around, so if we could just take a short stand up. <laughs> and uh, let's jump three times. And we can sit down again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So our character is Ronald McGregor, a detective. And actually, these two things might, be very, well, might very well be enough to establish a character. I know my name is Ronald McGregor, so I know what to do in the lab. I'll go around and say, hey, I'm a, my name is Ronald McGregor, and I know I'm a detective. So if, like, um, if there is a murder, or if something else fishy happens during the lab, I know what a detective does. I'm a detective! Let me try to solve the mystery. You know, this is as bare bones as it gets, but for some labs it works. Or we could add some more information, some more depth to the character. We could say that Ronald McGregor is an alcoholic detective who badly needs a job because he doesn't have enough money for rent. Aha, even more of a motivation. Now we have even more to build on. Okay, oh, that's a murder, hooray! <laughs> Will anyone pay me to solve the mystery? Or we could go by way of, of uh, talking about how the character should seem to others. Uh, how do other players or other characters perceive this character? Ron McGregor is a man who always sits in a slouched posture, nervously fiddles with a cigarette he never lights, and often clenches a whiskey glass in his other hand. He keeps staring curiously uh, at little details other people miss, asks inquisitive questions as if he always, uh, is always trying to put together pieces of a puzzle. Now notice in this text I don't say that Ron McGregor is a detective. I don't need to say that. The player can add this detail themselves. Uh, in any case, the function I want Ron McGregor to have in the LARP, the appearance I want him to have, uh, is communicated clearly through this. And as a player, I know what to do at the lap. I will uh, sit around in slouch postures, nervously fiddle with cigarettes, uh, clench a glass of whiskey, and stare curiously at little de details, and always ask inquisitive questions. So I have a reason to interact with the others. Now, to take an example for them from the lap, um, Love in the Age of Debasement, uh, which I mentioned earlier, um, <laughs> it's about couples breaking up. Uh, the characters in this were written in a very particular way. They were written as the inner thoughts of the character. Uh, so to, if we were trying to write our detective in the same way as those characters was written, he would be something like this. Ashtray flavoured whiskey rolling down my throat, beat, dub, beat, yeah, forget them unpaid bills, no use thinking of them, no use drinking, no use not drinking. Solve the crime, win the dame, dub, beat, dub, staring at that thing that doesn't make sense, asking them questions they don't want to ask. What do I care? What should I care? Just a private investigator, ma'am. So this is kind of how does the world look like to the characters, an inner monologue. It's uh, what I should be thinking when, when I'm playing, and then from that I can uh, interpret my way to a body language, a uh, way of interacting with other people, uh, a way of being this character. Or we could drop all the text and send the player this picture. Do we really need to say that much more? Now, in addition, we have some, some uh, costume suggestions uh, for the player. Uh, or we could define the player through the, no, the character through the character's relationships to other characters. So Ronald McGregor works at McGregor's detective agency together with Annabel Stark, who is his secretary. He is a member of the group Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, together with John Harrington, Lady Winterfield, and Harry Carrione. However, he is an inactive member. Uh, so these three other characters might have a reason to ask uh, Ronald McGregor, you know, why haven't you been to meetings recently? Are you back on the bottle? Uh, he was married to Lisa Pretty McGregor, who is divorced, and there are no children. So now we know what, what kind of interaction they might have if they meet in the game. Um, I also know that now is a particularly bad time to take a phone. Uh, and he pays rent to Anola Fowl. 
who might have the information that her tenant has not paid rent in a while. Uh, so with these relationships and groups uh, that uh, Roland McGregor belongs to, we also learn a lot about the character and enough to begin role-playing. Uh, another way of writing characters, borrowed from the LARP, played at this location called A Quiet Evening with a Family, which was based on theatre plays. In this case, players read through four theatre plays in advance uh, and then jumped into the game uh, and uh, halfway replayed the theatre plays and halfway took them into new directions through improvisation. If we did this with Ronald McGregor, we might write him as a dialogue. Are you a detective? asks Lady Winterfield. Ronald sips his whiskey. Who's asking? One of the wealthiest women in all of Britain. In that case, ma'am, yes, I'm, I'm a detective. Are you any good? And so by establishing this dialogue, and it would work very well if the players of Lady Winterfield and Ronald McGregor sit down before the game and read it together to get a feel of the, of the interaction. Uh, we have also established a working character. Now, I'll have a final example of how not to do it. <laughs> Roland McGregor was born in Oxbridgeshire in 1939. His mother was Helena McGregor. She was born in 1920 and had grown up in nearby Sheepfordshire, the daughter of a Puritan minister and a milkmaid from Orshognessy, which is in the northeast coast of Ireland. She was a kind and caring mother, but struggled with bouts of asthma, or the whooping wolfies, as they call them in those type days and so on. Uh, as an old fart larp, I've received a few of those characters, and uh, I don't mind uh, characters being good fiction. I love good fiction, and I love a good, well-written character. However, when you go into a great amount of detail in a character's backstory, what you lose is clarity. Because if I know everything about Ronald McGregor's family's life, it will be hard for me to remember that my main function in the game is to be the curious uh, alcoholic detective. Uh, and so the more other information I add, the less I get to the important parts. But I've seen these things combined, a well-written backstory, uh, and uh, a well-written backstory, and in addition, uh, a few highlights at the beginning of the character say, the most important thing there, player, is that you are so-and-so. Here comes your backstory. Now, the value of the backstory is twofold. Uh, one thing is the organizers telling the player, we care about you. We have written all this stuff for you, their player, just you for this character. And that actually has a motivating effect. The other aspect of it is if you want a long, complex game, which is very close to reality, and you as a designer want to control it very much, uh, the long backstory can uh, limit player improvisations to the field that you feel is appropriate in the game. If I only now have the picture of Ronald McGregor, I'm free to invent all kinds of details about his childhood. But if it's important to me as a, as a LARP designer uh, that Ronald McGregor meets his childhood friends and this plays some role in our drama, if that is important to me, uh, I might need to write out the backstory of those childhood friends. So, how to achieve clarity? Make sure the player knows what you need them to do, what their function in the LARP is. Uh, both facts and emotions are good. Uh, to being clear doesn't mean you can't talk in an emotional language or a poetic language uh, or a language that is open for interpretation. Uh, you should use the style that works best for you and for the LARP. Uh, this is where individual ar artistry comes in. Some LARPs require certain kinds of characters. Some LARPs are improved by a very brief, clear, concise way of writing. Others are improved by more poetry. In the case of, uh, of um, Love in the Age of Debasement, for example, uh, these inner monologues touch very much on the inner conflicts that the characters were dealing with uh, in the language that the characters themselves used. So that worked very well for that LARP, but it wouldn't work very well for the Monitor Celestra. Uh, and stereotypes make for easy playability. So Ronald McGregor, the alcoholic detective, uh, who is broke and uh, so on, he is a stereotype. Uh, but the thing is, the, pr the, pr the problem with Ronald McGregor is uh, uh, we know him from crime fiction. We know him from film noir and from various uh, Hollywood films. We know him from Roger Rabbit. Uh, but the moment there is no murder and uh, his alcoholicism isn't in play and so on, we don't really know what to do with Ronald McGregor. He needs something more to be a real person who can react to changing circumstances. Uh, I call this something more dissonance. Uh, and the easiest way of, of, of dissonance, the, which is the uh, deferring in sometimes incompatible parts of a personality. 
so one example of dissonance is to tell someone that you're the proud, responsible, caring, loving father of the family, but you have a hard time controlling your anger. So we're describing basically a good guy. If we had stopped at the first period here, we would have a very one-dimensional char uh, character. Somebody would just go around being loving, caring and responsible. We add anger management issues and pride that uh, doesn't allow him to apologize. And now we have a recipe for creating drama, but we also have a recipe for creating depths. In some cases, the loving, caring, fatherly side of this character can come to the front. In other cases, uh, the pride and the anger can come to the front. So he has a broader area to react in. The happy troubadour, the musician, the singer, the, jo the joke teller, who is still recovering after the death of his lover. <coughs> Again, it's not just a simple happy character who spreads happiness. We also have a melancholy and other side of the character to come into play at different times. That's what I had to say on the topic of clarity. Remember the three points, clarity, activity and connectivity. So to say a little bit about activity, how to provide players with stuff to do in the LARP. The first question we need to ask when thinking about uh, characters is can they do this stuff in the LARP? You know, if you have a character who is a doctor, a medical doctor, and very good at saving lives, that, that's a tremendously useful character to have in a LARP which is, is about uh, war or accidents or any situation where people are injured. But in a LARP where everybody's jumping around being healthy and worrying about anything other than their own health, uh, the doctor might not have that much to do. We need some other things for the doctor to do. Saying he's a med medic is not enough. Uh, also saying that somebody is a construction worker that's an identity. Yes, I'm a construction worker. I work in construction. I'm a hard-working guy. And now I don't have anything more to play on because I am at a dinner party. Uh, so what do I do at dinner parties? Okay, I have an identity. There's nothing wrong with playing the construction worker at a dinner party. But in addition to that, I need some hooks to relate to the dinner party. Um, but of course, if we're out building a house and the LARP is about when we built the great building, then the construction worker character has a lot more to do. So when things change, how do characters manage that? How do they respond to a crisis? Uh, if the player doesn't know how their characters are likely to respond to a crisis, they will be likely to fall back on whatever they normally do, which is either on the run screaming or shouting, is there a doctor in the house? Uh, or taking charge or whatever. So if you want a character to, to take charge in times of emergency, it might be a good idea to provide them with that information. Uh, and also, is there a potential in, in the character for learning new behavior? Now, the biggest mistake I often see we make as lop designers and players make as players is to, to reduce the character to a single set of actions. Uh, and if you're stuck in a single set of actions, a single way of being, when things change in the lop, uh, you don't have much to do. Uh, so considering curiosity and other aspects of characters that make them more interesting to interact with and give them a greater ability to change is a good idea. <coughs> uh, and then there's the thing about focusing on the actual content of the LARP. If the LARP is about talking, you might want to, like, if the LARP is, is 10 diplomats sitting around in a meeting room discussing stuff, then you might really want to focus on how do they talk, what do they talk about, what does diplomatic talking look like? But then again, if it's, if it's about uh, running around in the forest and playing drums, then the talking might not be that important. Uh, if you have an action-oriented LARP uh, about fighting, uh, of course players will do the actual fighting on behalf of the characters, but it might be a good idea to define some things about why does the character fight, does the character have a reason to do so, is it motivated, and so on. And these were just some thoughts about what you need to think about in terms of activity, but there are a number of methods to bring more activity into characters, in, including writing down suggestions like, we suggest that you spend this LARP running around, hiding beneath tables, listening in on people's conversations, uh, and whispering in their ears stuff you've heard from other people. This is an actual example of a character. Uh, you are a construction worker. We suggest that you spend at least half of the LARP actually building stuff. I'm not too intrigued by that, but there are better professions to LARP. 
So to look at the connectivity aspect, and I think connectivity is maybe the most interesting thing because this is where we're talking about uh, where characters belong in the society. The moment you begin playing a LARP, you're creating a society. You're creating a small society or maybe a huge society. The Monte Celestra was uh, 130 people on a spaceship. That's a pretty big society. Uh, Halat Hisar uh, was 50 people simulating a much bigger society, two nation states. So, connectivity. Now, let me first ask you, if you meet this fellow here in the woods, let's say you're walking out here in Ruta at night, and suddenly you bump into this, this very large, very dangerous looking orc, um, what would you do? Yeah. Me too, if I, Eric, met this guy, I would probably scream and run, or I would suspect one of my friends of wearing a costume. Um, <laughs> so, the moment we see the orc with weapons and all of that stuff, we consider fighting or fleeing. Now, if I'm at a fantasy LARP in the woods and I'm a warrior, uh, my character is a warrior, then I'm very likely to fight. The moment I see this character, I'm very likely to, to draw my sword, because my character says, you're a warrior, you fight nasty orcs. But I also have the option of running away. Uh, if I am uh, a farmer at this LARP, hanging out in the village and selling my potatoes, uh, then my and I'm unarmed, my first thought might be to flee. However, if my character this, at this LARP is an orc, and uh, just like this fellow, then I might consider giving him a hug, toasting him. I mean, he's drinking some mead. I might boast about my uh, orcish ways. I might grunt. I might, I might still fight. I'll prob I'm probably not going to flee. So this, these things are called affordances, the perceivable possibilities for action. And when we role play, we are all the time reacting to the affordances around us. We see other characters, we see their costumes, uh, we remember what we've been told about them, and we see what can I do with this character? Fight, flee, hug, toast, boast, uh, have a long conversation with, offer tea to, uh, sell stuff to, buy stuff from, and so on. So when deciding for connectivity, it's worthwhile thinking about which affordances do these characters offer to other characters. And as mentioned, the affordances will vary by who the other characters are. So characters must give the player reason to interact with other characters. Again, sitting in the corner of the inn all the time isn't much fun unless the hobbits arrive. But they should also give other players a reason to interact with your character. Uh, they should have clear affordances. One example is uh, at a couple of uh, LARPs I've been to, there has been the character of the Catholic priest. The Catholic priest can work very well uh, in a LARP because uh, what you do if you're a Catholic and you've done something wrong, you go to the priest to confess. So immediately the, the presence of Catholic priest allows for these confession scenes to be played. Um, and when it comes to uh, establishing relationships and social structure between characters, the key word is quality, not quantity. Because if you, write, if you write, okay, you, you once drank a beer with this character, and you uh, once met this character on the street, and, and you make like 10 points of different characters you've met uh, in the past and that you might interact with now, that doesn't necessarily help that I met this person on the street a long time ago. It's only when the relationship will come into play during the LARP that the relationship becomes interesting. So it's better to think a lot about uh, which kind of relationships are interesting in this LARP than to think about, um, than to try to make as many of them as possible. Now, in addition to provide both connectivity and to provide activity, uh, characters might, um, uh, characters might uh, have goals and motivations. Now, a goal is to do, uh, do something. Make sure that you are a new king. And a motivation is the reason you want to do something. And a motivation is much more worth than a goal. Uh, you hunger for power and respect. Therefore, you would like to be the new king. Now, the moment your brother or sister becomes new king or queen, uh, you will have something to do because you still hunger for power and respect. But if it, it only says in your character, you want to be the new king, then the moment a new king is appointed, uh, whether it's you or somebody else, uh, then you don't have much more to do. Characters may have conflicts with other characters, and conflicts arise when two characters have different have goals that are mutually incompatible. Uh, they might have puzzles to solve, like there are there is a murder, and you want to figure it out. Uh, and the organisers have hidden clues all around the house. Uh, they might have fates; those are predetermined events. 
uh, then you might simply tell someone that, okay, around two hours into the LARP, uh, you should do this. Uh, in two hours into the LARP, you should make sure that the old king is dead. And then you might trigger the battle of succession. Now, secrets when writing characters are tricky. I'm not going to say they are wrong. I'm going to say they are tricky. Uh, a secret identity may uh, never be revealed. So I'm sitting around in the corner of the inn for two whole days, and I'm really the future king of Gondor. Uh, but the LARP ends before anybody finds out. Then it's just my inner monologue. Uh, so if the secret is never revealed, there will be no role playing as a, a result of it. Uh, and so if I'm a super spy, but I pretend to be a farmer, and I'm really good at pretending to be a farmer, then for all practical purposes in this LARP, I'm a farmer, not a super spy. If you set up secret communities, uh, a political conspiracy, stuff like that, uh, they need places to meet and stuff to do, or the community is just a paper thing, it's not part of the LARP. Uh, I heard a wise person once say that a secret is something only one person knows. If anybody else knows this, it's not really a secret and begins spreading out and so on. However, that's exactly the kind of secret that's interesting for a LARP. It's a cool surprise, which is carried by a character, but it has to get out there for, for things to be interesting. Uh, an old way of constructing uh, a society is this the three affiliations model. It comes from the LARP 1942, which set up a simulated a Norwegian village in, in the year 1942. Uh, there they worked with each character and associated them with three groups. First of all, each character had a family and a position in the family. Uh, daughter, son, uh, brother, cousin and so on. Uh, secondly, they had jobs. They were fishermen, or they were, were seamstresses, or they ran the local inn, or they worked for the German occupants, uh, occupiers, and so on. And they had friends, a circle of friends. They might be a member of the, of the secret poker uh, tournament, because uh, poker was very no-no in this community, but then somebody might meet to play poker anyway. And with these three things, uh, you got a full character and a full set of relationships. Um, but important for this was that all of these were activities that took place in the LARP. In this LARP, the fishermen actually had to go out and fish every day, or people wouldn't have, fish, have food to eat in the evening. Uh, the seamstresses actually had to go to the factory to sew clothes. This was a part of the LARP, so the work dimension became quite important. And likewise, the eating happened with the families. So after you've done your fishing, uh, you do the food making and the, and the dining, and the family has a reason to exist. Now, there is a difference in writing characters for short LARPs, and by short LARPs I mean from two to six hours, and long LARPs, which can go over several days. At a short LARP, you need focus. You only really have one shot. People can't change their character interpretation much uh, during a brief period of time. Um, so you need to be very clear, very, br very brief, that this is what you need to start with. This is what you need to play on. Once you get to a long LARP, uh, four or five days, you need depth. You need complexity, you need this ability to change in changing circumstances. You need more background, stuff like that. I'm just uh, dragging up this character, which you can also find online if you Google for Mad About the Boy, which was a law held in Norway uh, three, four years ago. Um, the reason I mention this character is because I consider this some of the best characters ever written. Probably not the best literary fiction characters ever written, but the best functional characters ever, ever written. Uh, so if you want some inspiration in character writing, Google Mad About the Boy LARP and take a look at the characters. And I usually caution against describing a character as shy and introvert and so on. And just as a final word, uh, at this LARP, which was, was about uh, social realist Easter dinner amongst Romanian immigrants in uh, uh, Italy, we have a character who is extremely introvert and all rules can be broken. This character worked very, very well. It worked very well because uh, there were only eight characters, there were only, uh, there were only a, a few lines of text for each character, and we established in, through role-playing before the LARP uh, how the other people reacted and behaved towards this introvert friend. So every rule I've mentioned here so far can be broken confidently. Uh, I've mentioned them as things to think about when you work anyway. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.
And during the next few days, uh, there will be the character writing workshop where we'll get to try out this stuff in practice. So I'm not sure if I have time for questions. I can take two or three. Yeah. Is, are there any questions? I can take two or three. Uh, yeah, it's all. Um, I've had this speech before, so it's on the Law Writer Summer School website. Uh, I think there is a section called Past Material, and I guess there will also be published a set of presentations from this year. Yeah. What do you mean by the web, uh, the play style of other characters? Yeah, um, I was actually thinking about the playing style of other players. Uh, I mean, the um, people have preferences and they have different, different preferences and different abilities. And some role players like very much to try to be in the center of uh, attention of things. And that's something you need to, to keep in mind when casting a character. Uh, some people like very much to pursue uh, mystery and puzzle solving and the kind of gamist uh, aspect of role playing. Uh, and they will tend to take their character in towards kind of solving the mystery, whether you write it for them or not. Uh, so, if you're writing a mystery game, it might be good to take the most eager mystery solver and give them the, the character with the strongest motivation for solving mysteries. So that's part of taking, taking the playstyle into account. But another aspect here is that, um, I mean, we are not born uh, attention grabbers or mystery solvers or anything like that. Uh, we, we can change our behavior when we need to. Uh, so, a uh, second aspect of this playstyle thing is for the LARP designer to be clear about this is how you play this LARP. This is a LARP about mystery, so you should try to solve it. This is not a LARP about mystery, this is a LARP about interpersonal relationships. Uh, so you should focus on, on playing that. And you should focus on playing scenes between two or three people instead of scenes with, the, with everybody gathered. Uh, so players will usually listen to this kind of instructions. Usually, but not always. Sometimes their own preferences will override your wishes as a designer. Mm. Okay, final question. Could you say a bit more about what made the characters in Mad About the Boy so exemplary? Yeah. How they're written? Uh, part, partially with the language they're written in. Uh, it's a mixture between pure fact and facts that you need to role play, uh, but also inspiration. Like each character was associated with a tarot card. Uh, that was depicted in the character, uh, which was more mythological. This was not a mythological game. It wasn't a game about tarot cards or the occult or anything like that. Uh, but it was still there to say something about the archetype your character embodied. Uh, it is very to the point about who your character is related to. Uh, and they were very transparent. Like they, all of the characters were in trios. So there were three, uh, three characters in a, to a group. And all of these characters were given, the texts were given to every member of the group, so you could read your co-player's texts, uh, which made for a very quick overview of the kind of group dynamic uh, that the designers wanted and had designed for. Yep. Thank you very much. Mm.